Last month, I did a retrospective on Ultima 7 and how the Blackgate has become my favorite game in the series. But there was also an expansion pack for the game called The Forge of Virtue that comes installed with the GOG version. I noticed shortly after starting Ultima 7, an earthquake shook up Britannia. I didn't know what had caused it until I saw Lord British, who informed me the Isle of Fire had arisen in the sea. The name sounded familiar. I rode my magic carpet to the mysterious Isle of Fire. And as I entered the ruins of an ancient castle, it all came back to me. This was the final castle from Ultima 3 Exodus. Exodus was my very first Ultima game, and I played the NES port by Pony Canyon. Playing through the forge made me want to go back and play the old NES game again, which I did. Ultima Exodus starts you off by allowing you to customize the entire party, choosing class and race, which in itself was pretty revolutionary for the time. Your choices play an important role in the stats, which directly tie in with your abilities and your playstyle. I went with a paladin, thief, wizard, cleric combo. After a briefing with Lord British, I was thrown into the open world of Cesaria. From there, you can take your party almost anywhere, and there aren't clear instructions about where you should go, giving players a degree of freedom that was very unique for the time. I loved visiting all the different towns and talking with all the people within. I recognize that by modern standards, the dialogue is limited, but back then, even having towns full of NPCs was incredible. The world is a lot smaller than I remembered it. I think the fog of war played a big part in making the whole of Cesaria feel much bigger than it actually was because you can't see where you're going. The cities are full of hidden areas where you'll almost always find some random NPC wandering about with a clue. They were cryptic, but meaningful. There were random musings, hints of mystical weapons, and even easter eggs with someone named John claiming they knew more about Ultima than I did. It was world building before I knew what world building was, weaving together a rich lore that made me want to know more about the world of Cesaria. The manual has some of the backstory, explaining that rumors abound about a fiery island which has emerged in the southwestern seas. Little is known of the evil that dwells there, it is known only as Exodus. Mondane and Minax have cast a spell on Exodus, this island of fire, and the little known island has started volcanic activity. Lord British has sent out a call across time and space in search of four valiant warriors. Their quest to return peace to the kingdom. They must solve the riddle of Exodus. You are the leader of this quest. Some hints from NPCs led me to find a hidden town, Dawn, that sold the best weapons in the game. It only revealed itself at certain times of the phasing of the moon. The shopkeeper within had the gold pick in a treasure chest that's accessible from across the counter. I snatched it and had the guards on me. Fortunately, this time around, I learned a trick from speedrunners. If you go to the status screen, then cancel out, but hold a direction on the controller, it'll freeze all enemies on screen. Back then, I didn't have that knowledge, so the guards caught up with me and they were really hard to beat. But that's also one of the coolest parts of the game. You can challenge anyone to battle, including NPCs, the guards, and Lord British himself. Exodus is a playground, one that might not have aged as well as Ultima 7, but that posed a lot of choices at a time when most games were linear romps. The dungeons scattered throughout the continent are first-person mazes that hide the four marks players need. They're hard to navigate, but in a game where you need lots and lots of gold, the treasure chests within are a boon. The fourth floor of the Cave of Gold is a treasure trove. Go to the southeast corner, grab all the treasure chests, exit, then come back in, and do it all over again. I'll admit this time around I did use online maps, but back then, online maps didn't exist so I had to chart the maps by hand. I do remember I found three of the marks, King, which raises the character's maximum level, Force, which prevents damage from the force fields, and Fire, which does away with injuries from lava on the ground. Each mark is branded on your character, making them lose 50 HP in the process. In a dungeon full of traps, the wind blowing out your candles, and some of the hardest enemies in the game trying to destroy you, that 50 HP drain felt like a cruel punishment. There were also many hidden doors so I more or less had to check every wall. The game throws harder enemies at you as you level up your characters. At level 5, pirate ships start appearing. Defeating them gives you access to their ship, which opens up the rest of the world. You can use it to find hidden items like magic armor. You can also use the ship to enter the whirlpool that takes you to Ambrosia. Ambrosia is a whole different world covered in either ash or snow. It's home to the four shrines, wisdom, intelligence, dexterity, and strength. These shrines are the only way to raise each character's attributes. 
Much of the path is hidden, and while there weren't many enemies, I felt like I'd warped into a strange alien world. The shrines are the only place to find special cards necessary to complete the game. You can only get them by learning the Pray command from an NPC in the city of Yu. The prayer can be used again in Yu at the center of a circle of fire to obtain a special item, the Silver Horn. If you use that praying command in the Shrines of Ambrosia, players can then receive the cards. The game is brutally hard. There's no escaping from battles, at least until you get an item called the Compass Heart. If you're unlucky and meet enemies that are too strong for your party, it's most likely game over. Many treasure chests have traps in them that require a spell to avoid unless you have a very dexterous thief. Resurrections and curing poisons without magic gets very expensive. There was also the painful mechanic of food that forced you to keep the party well fed. The food gauge acts like timers in arcade games and the moment your food goes to zero, your HP starts to drop. That means you have to stock up on food at the grocery store which costs money and necessitates more grinding. It also creates a sense of anxiety, especially in the dungeons, since if you go in then get lost and food is running out, you are most likely dead. Combat mode places your characters in a chess-like field. You have to move your characters into position if you're relying on melee. Magic spells, especially in the earlier levels, do a great job clearing out the screen, so make sure to include spellcasters in your party. Their success is dependent on the animation pose of the monsters, so that's one thing to pay attention to in battle. Getting a projectile weapon like the bow is important for your non-magic users, since battles relying on hand-to-hand -hand combat take longer as you can only move your characters one tile at a time. Even though there's a nice variety of foes, their battle styles don't change much other than increasing HP and damage. Exacerbating the difficulty of leveling up is the fact that only the party member who actually slays their foe gets experience. Also cancelling a move means you lose that turn. All in all, it wasn't the best combat system in an RPG, even though I enjoyed it as a kid. There was a point where I was grinding so much and raising all my stats, I became overpowered. Once your wizard learns death and the cleric learns destroy, fights become a joke. I still struggled with the game because I couldn't find the final mark, which was the snake. It's necessary to complete the game as together with the silver horn, it removes the big snake that blocks the way to Exodus' castle. For months, I was lost and actually gave up on finishing it. Then I saw one of those gaming tip books. There was an entry for Ultima Exodus and it revealed that the Mark of Snake was on the bottom floor of the Cave of Soul. I fired up Ultima Exodus again, found the Cave of Soul which can only be accessed by boat or moon gates, and finally got the brand of the Mark of Snake. I was ecstatic. Equally so in the present when I found it again. From there, I rode my boat to the Isle of Fire, played the silver horn I'd found in you, and then entered Exodus's castle. Inside, the enemies were tough, but I was equally strong. There were some invisible floor enemies right before the final confrontation. But the last sequence is taking the cards I'd found at the shrines and then rearranging them in a specific order as given to me by the Time Lord, who makes his first appearance in the game and plays a pivotal role in Ultima 7. I was confused by the ending. Why cards? What did they signify? What was Exodus and where was he? I never got answers since after the cards were in place, the castle falls apart in a mode that reminded me of Metroid and was unique to the NES port. I made my escape, I'm actually not sure if there's a risk of failing at this point, but I'd conquered one of the hardest games of my childhood. Ultima Exodus represented a lot of firsts for me and inspired many of the JRPGs I'd come to love with concepts like a separate battle screen, numerous towns, and an open overworld. The game isn't too expensive to pick up, and I found a complete inbox copy for around $20 on eBay. I also bought a Famicom copy of the original Japanese game, which is fun to look through, especially with its anime aesthetic. Exodus has a hint book that is fantastic. There's actually a whole manga explaining the history of the previous games that show how Lord British came to Caesarea. I picked it up on eBay as I didn't actually have the original, and really enjoyed it and the way the art shows what happened in the previous Ultima games. Back to Ultima 7 and the Forge of Virtue, I entered the old ruins of Fire Isle, wondering what was inside. I found one inhabitant, a mage named Erethian, who explains many of the questions about the nature of Exodus all these years later. Exodus was a half-machine, half-human hybrid stuck between two worlds, with one half getting taken away by the gargoyles. The cards had sundered that communication bridge, forcing Exodus away. 
His descriptions of the past bosses help with the lore, explaining or more likely retconning the past. I was thrilled to learn more about the story behind Ultima Exodus. I also learned that the dark core of Exodus, his intellectual side, was still inside the castle ruins. As Arethian writes in his book, Exodus was a mixture of ethereal being and magical mechanism. Its living portion or psyche was comprised of its ambitions, desires, curiosity, in total, its personality. The subject matter of this tome, however, lies upon a part of its more physical manifestation. The core was the receptacle of Exodus's memories and mental force. The psyche was almost like a parasite feeding off the world around and depositing what it gained within the core. The entirety of the expansion pack is actually pretty short and revolves mainly around the three trials that await within the castle. The first, the test of truth, has a nod to the caves that have been so difficult to navigate in Ultima Exodus where hidden doors were the key to finding an essential item. In the same way, there are lots of false treasures as well as a whole section with invisible walls. The answer to the trial is much simpler. There's a hidden pathway behind an early passable wall marked by a hoodie. The trial of love involves the sacrifice of the two golem brothers and shows what they're willing to do for brotherly love. The avatar's job is to give them back their lives using a ritual while simultaneously getting a glimpse into what constitutes love. The trial of courage is the longest and is primarily focused on combat against hordes of enemies. There is a final confrontation against a giant dragon that can't be killed without the aid of a special sword. Here's where the forged part of the title comes into play as players will physically forge the most powerful sword in the game. They need to put the sword on the forge and use water on it, then use the hammer and anvil, put in water and repeat. The last step is to place the demon Arcadian within the sword. The black sword will help you to easily kill the dragon as well as most foes in the game. The final part of the expansion pack has you locking up the dark core in the ethereal void. The job you hadn't quite completed in Exodus reaches its culmination here. Place the special lenses, which you can grab from the museum in Britannia, on either side of the core, and then position the talismans you earn from the trials. Erethian, who had wanted to resurrect Exodus, destroys himself in the process of trying to stop the party. Exodus is sealed away once and for all. I'd finished the journey I'd begun decades ago. Lord British will double the Avatar's attributes as a reward. That in turn makes the rest of Ultima 7 a cakewalk. I do want to mention another very cool Exodus nod in Ultima 7 in the new Ambrosia, whereas before it was a huge lost continent, now it's just a small island with much of the land having been destroyed by a meteor storm. Inside the caves I found a very talkative three-headed Hydra. With the black sword in hand, the Hydra was easily annihilated. Even if the sequence was short, it was nice to find out what happened to Ambrosia. While I loved Ultima 7, the Forge's power-ups made the endgame a little too easy. But for me, the Forge represented a revisit to the original land and time that introduced me to the Ultima series. Age is a weird thing, the years go by faster, but I honestly don't feel that much older. Seeing Exodus in the present and then going back to the past reminded me of how much had changed. Back when I first placed Exodus, I was just an elementary school kid, hoping to beat this really hard game. All these years later, I'm a narrative director at a game studio, writing games and studying what game developers did in the past, learning from their genius, and hopefully being able to inspire future gamers with all new stories. It's like the two halves of Exodus, but whereas in Forge, I sundered the connection completely, the game itself functioned as a bridge between the two parts of my life. I'm extremely excited to play Blackgate's sequel, Serpent's Isle. After the first game, multiple people mentioned that they thought Serpent's Isle is actually better than Blackgate. I really hope that's the case, and I'm actually saving it for myself. Thanks as always to everyone who watched this retrospective. I'll probably tackle Fantasy Star 3 or Serpent's Isle next. If you like my videos, please consider hitting the subscribe button. Otherwise, see you next time, Avatar.